All right. Um, hey, Jake, how you doing? Good. How are you, Santiago? <laughs> doing well, doing well. Um, I just learned today that, and uh, this is, uh, I guess, your, your fun fact for the day, is that uh, today in 1977 was the premiere of uh, the first Star Wars movie of A New Hope, which at the time is not called A New Hope. Um, and also today, exactly six years later, uh, was uh, The Return of the Jedi, the last in the first trilogy, um, exactly six years six years later, on the 25th of May. So um, I would say the last good Star Wars movie. <laughs> Rogue One's pretty good. I like that one. Um, oh, that is good. Yeah, so yeah, I think I think they missed the mark, though. Like, they really should have made it May the 4th as opposed to May the 25th. It's like they, yeah they they just didn't know they weren't like ahead in their marketing to see that coming that was yeah. going to be a thing <laughs> yeah yeah um bad bad marketers over there in the 70s for sure um, um what else is new with you jake are you excited for this session that uh we're going to kick off here in just a bit S super excited been watching a lot of the playoffs been watching a lot of blowouts so um handy because i can just go to bed early um, if, you know, a team's up by a ton, they, you know, they used to say that no lead was safe in the NBA, but it doesn't really seem like at this playoffs, a lot of blowouts, <laughs> but there's been some good games. Good, good. I'm excited to see some of your predictions today um, on that. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, uh, just taking a look at, at some the time here, um, I think maybe we, we shouldn't delay. We should, uh, we should get started with our meetup and, uh, and get things rolling. What do you say, Jake? Sounds good to me. All right. So welcome, everybody, uh, to the Future of Data Meetup. Um, my name is Santiago Geraldo. I lead product marketing uh, for Clutter's data services um, with a big focus on machine learning, uh, streaming, analytics, uh, and operational database, as well as data engineering. Um, fun fact about me, uh, I was uh, born in Colombia. Um, and have been working as have worked as a practicing data scientist and as a, a technical professional for many years before sort of moving into where I'm at today, um, which is kind of straddling that business and technology side. I'm still a data scientist and data worker at heart, um, and I'm really excited uh, to essentially talk today about the topic that, that Jake Bengston, who is our guest here, will be presenting on. Um, the topic overall is. Uh, predicting the NBA playoffs, uh, predicting who will win. And Jake has put a lot of time in uh, into essentially deeply understanding what these data sets look like, how we can work with them, and how we can make accurate predictions. Um, what's interesting about this is that all the projects that we work on are open source. And the origin for this is actually an applied machine learning prototype that was developed by the Fast Forward Labs team at Cloudera, um, which is also open source. Um, and then Jake was able to essentially transform it uh, to serve a different purpose, which I think will be will be quite exciting. Um, and just FYI for everybody, we are live streaming across LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. And we will be uh, monitoring questions and answering them at the end of the session. Um, so make sure that you're asking very liberally and that, uh, and that you're engaging in conversation. Um, one of the motivators for this is that we do have a raffle at the end. Uh, everyone who participates in the chat and asks questions uh, will be entered into the drawing. So make sure you're asking early, make sure you're asking often, and we're going to try to get to the, as many of those as possible. Uh, for this raffle, there will be two winners, uh, and you can see the prize packages pictured here. And we'll do this in a random drawing at the end of the presentation. Note that you must be present to win. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand it off to Jake. Uh, Jake, do you want to introduce yourself and then kick this session off? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, hello, everyone. How's it going? I'm uh, Jake Bankson. I'm a product marketer at Cloudera, where I focus on machine learning products. A little bit of fun fact about myself is I grew up in the west entrance of Glacier National Park in Montana. I have a town of about 100 people. Um, there were probably more bears than people in my, in my hometown. And um, I'm actually, if you, if you see boxes in the background, so I'm in, I'm Houston based right now, but I'm, I'm going to be moving up to Montana tomorrow, me and my family. So moving back home, really excited for that and to escape the Houston weather. Um, but without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in to the demo. Um, so uh, first of all, I just want to talk about, and Sanjay made, made mention of it today, uh, it's really focused on how I repurpose uh, an applied machine learning prototypes. 
So uh, at Cloudera, specifically within our machine learning product, we have this notion of what we call AMPs. And what AMPs are, are they are they're fully open source, end-to-end -end data science projects built by Fast Forward Labs, so built by our research group here at Cloudera. Uh, they are great because, you know, if you think about um, my background, I come from a data science background. And usually when, first of all, when starting off from a project, a lot of times, if you're just starting from scratch, you know, A, it can be overwhelming and B, you're likely like going out and trying to find how other people did uh, certain uh, certain functions or, or different data exploration steps, and you're you're grabbing code from here and there. You know you're looking through what's available in Stack Overflow or or various GitHub accounts, and the code that you get isn't necessarily vetted. It hasn't been rigorously tested. I have no idea if I'm getting code from a 12 year old. Maybe it's great code from a 12 year old, but I have no guarantee for sure that anyone has tested or verified and that this is actually the best way to do it. So what I really love about working with AMPS is that I know that this has gone through a rigorous testing and review process. It's built by a vetted researcher with academic credentials. Uh, and as well, um, it's, uh, I, can, I can go in and I can see kind of with a single click in Cloudera Machine Learning, I can deploy and, and see it working from end to end. So if, if we look through here, this is the catalog of the various AMPs that are available you know, within Cloudera. So we have everything from churn modeling with scikit-learn. We have an AMP to look at structural time series. We have one to look at how I can do auto ML with Teapot. All this is open source. So for any one of these AMPs, if anyone here is interested, you don't need to be a Cloudera customer. Uh, you can go ahead and just view the code on GitHub. So if we looked at if we look at this one, for example, this is Streamlit on CML. This is a given example of how to launch a Streamlit application. Uh, very useful code. If it's your first time working with Streamlit, it'll give you a working application to go against. So that's a little bit about AMPs. Uh, the one that I was using for my project is actually this churn modeling with scikit-learn. So if we take a look at this AMP, we can see that it demonstrates how to build a logistic regression classification probability for a fictitious telecommunications company. And I am repurposing that project that was done to instead not um, predict if someone is going to churn from a company or going to leave the services of a telecommunication co telecommunications company. I'm instead predicting who the NBA champion will be in 2022. Slightly different problems, but there was a lot of code that was very reusable within this. This gave me like a great starting point to go from. It gave me um, a built-in class that I could use to store my model, to serve up that model, uh, and to build... Uh, build that model in a production environment with an API and build also a web application with Flask. So a lot of really reusable stuff, even though a lot of the data science and I'll, I'll walk you through that I did was very different. The data was very different, but a lot of the stuff I was able to reuse. So um, really fun, really interesting stuff. So let's go ahead and actually look at the in CDP here. So I'm in CDP public cloud. I'm going to go ahead and look at our machine learning services. Uh, today, I'm going to be learn using, um, let's see if I can sign back in here. It's not a demo unless you have a little bit of technical difficulties. There we go. If it's big, so everyone can see. So I'm going to be hopping into a workspace here. This is a demo workspace we have set up in AWS within CDP. Uh, you can see this is all my projects that I have working on. You can, you know, I, I have I have a lot of different things that I look at and, and have fun working on different data science projects. Um, the one that I started with was churn modeling with scikit-learn. And so we, it, it was really easy to set this up within CML. I just went um, I just went into the AMPS catalog. I selected the one that I wanted to work with and I clicked configure project and it was deployed and up and running. So really, really easy and simple to get started. Um, and I want to show you like what is available with the base project where I started from. Uh, first of all, you know, I, I had code. So I had code completely that was run within CML to, first of all, bootstrap, set up my environment, ingest the data from the fictitious telecommunications uh, company. I was able to show me how to explore that data, how to go through and build various different models against that. And then as well, um, then the specific scripts are available to train models and just serve up those models to, to, to an actual endpoint. And, and I can show you that. And then also, you know, build the application. And the last thing I want to point out is this churn explainer.py. Uh, this is something that I found probably to be the most useful. This set up a class called explain model. 
And this allows me to abstract and kind of store the various aspects of the model that I trained and stored and served up and then used later in the application. So it allowed me to, you know, save additional features all kind of along with it, like the data that was used, the specific labels um, used as inputs, the uh, a categorical encoder, if I was working with categorical data, which I actually wasn't, and so forth. Um, so if we look at as well, as I mentioned, so there was a model deployed for this that I was able to, to base my work off of. If we go and look at that, the churn model API endpoint, we can see this model is actually live in production right now. Um, and we can test and see that the model is running. So if we click test here, we can see we passed in these parameters. So this is what you would expect from a telecommunications company. We have like streaming TV. No, this person is not using streaming TV. The monthly charges are applied and so forth for an individual. And you can see the prediction that came back was probability of 0 0.03 that this person is going to leave and join another telecommunications company. So this is a great customer that we don't need to focus on. Um, this model, like I said, is live in production, it's set up against an endpoint that you could and give, you know, we give you example code and shell Python and R there. Uh, and then lastly, the application that is actually built with Flask for this project. So if we we open that up, I'll make it bigger so you can all see. You can see here that we have, this is an example of, uh, we have 10 random individuals and we have the probability that they're going to churn. So we, you can see we have this sorted with the highest to lowest probabilities of them churning. Um, and, and we use actually, so one of the cool things of this project is it uses Lime for model explainability. And then what is being done here, it's highlighting the features that Lime used and used to create those um, predictive values. So if we look, for example, let's go and look at this ID person 5673. Um, we can see that, okay, right, um, the return probability for them was 0.681. They're currently under a month to month contract. What if we wanted to see if I change it from a month to month contract to a one year contract, does it actually reduce the churn probability? Oh, what do you know? It does, which is why all your telecommunications companies tell you, hey, you need to sign up for one to two year contracts uh, so that you don't leave them. All makes sense now, right? Uh, that's probably not rocket science. If you're locked into a contract, it's pretty hard to leave, uh, thus lowering your churn probability. Not a ton of insight there, but this is what's been set up. This was my starting point to begin from. So let's go back and let's dig into the actual project because I doubt if you joined uh, a meetup to to look at NBA data that you're really excited about churn modeling for telecommunications companies. Okay, so first of all, let's take a look in here uh, of the code that I'm working with. Um, we'll look at the data ingest script first. So I started out, I needed to find NBA data. This wasn't available within my current project. I looked around, I, I thought about just downloading data like from basketball reference. But what I did is I found a pretty neat open source library called Sportsify. I was able to easily import that library within Cloudera and make use of it. It basically abstracts the basketballreference.com APIs and it makes it very easy to iterate through and get lots of data about uh, different levels of granularity. So what I did is I wanted to get um, for each team, I wanted to get the data for the season. So like accumulative stats for the entire season, I use just very basic stats. We're talking like rebound, defensive rebounds, offensive rebounds, field, two point field goals attempted, two point field goals made, two point field goal percentage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I, so I brought that all in. I went from, I made the decision to start at the three point era. If you see a lot of the modern like NBA models that are built, they usually look at the three point era. Basically basketball completely changed once there was a three point line. I did try and experiment a little bit with data before the three point era and it really threw off my model. So um, did not include that in this. So the range I'm looking at is from 1980 to 2023. We iterate through and I, and I bring in the data for each team from that. Um, one thing that the data did not have is that it didn't have if that team actually won the championship championship that year. So I had to use my old trusty friend, Beautiful Soup, to go ahead and, and scrape some data actually from the basketballreference.com playoffs page uh, and pull out which team each year won the NBA championship. Then I just merged that all together and created myself a data set that had in each row, it has the team stats for that year, what season it is, and then whether or not that team won the championship. So if we look at the frame, the framing of my problem, I'm looking at at the end of a season. So end of game 82, the playoffs are about to start. 
of those teams, can I predict with some level of accuracy which team actually wins the NBA championship? So this is taking no, not into any account, you know, playoff success that has happened. And actually, you know, in my data, I don't have any playoff data. I only have regular season data. That's probably somewhere that I could look at to improve my model, which is, it's probably, you know, it plays every data scientist. You can, you can iterate and iterate, and iterate on what you're doing forever. You can bring in more and more new data sets. I plan on actually continuing working on this problem. And I can talk about some of the different features that I want to bring in, but a little bit more like advanced stat that I think would be, have highly predictive values. So let's go ahead and hop out and let's take a look at the data a little bit. Um, if we look at NBA champion, I'm going to open up a session. I actually have one session running right now. I've been running it for a while. There was one grid search that I was still running that I wanted to leave running. So uh, a session that I'm opening up here, this is just a Docker container that is uh, rendering. Um, it has everything that I need, all the libraries I need to do my data science. I can pip install any additional libraries I need. It makes it very easy for me to, to um, build out my code and do anything I want to do as a data scientist. So um, first of all, you can see I, I, I bring in my MBA data. That's the data that I ingested in the previous data ingest script. Um, some of the things that I dropped right away, uh, I'm going to drop the year because that's actually a repeat column. If, if, we, if I showed it to you, um, I'm dropping the name because I already have abbreviation for the name. It had abbreviate. So it had like, for example, Phoenix. It had spelled out all of Phoenix, but also had PHO. Just want the abbreviation. Don't need two columns for that. Um, I'm, I'm repurposing some of the ways that I predicted I use for the actual predictor. So for champion, I'm replacing, instead of it saying, you know, champion one or zero, I'm putting in yes or no, because that is what was done actually in, um, the previous scikit-learn project. And so I decided just to follow that same format and then create a unique ID and so forth and so forth. So actually what I'll do, cause I, I, no, yeah. I'm going to stop this session that I have running. You can see how easy this is. I'm going to spin up uh, another session with a little bit smaller of a resource profile so I can be cost conscious because I don't need the full amount that I was working with. I'm going to work in Python 3.6 and I'm going to start this new session. See how easy that was? All right. In the scheduling, the pod is initializing. Um, enter some exciting music here and we are cooking with gas all right we're up and running jupyter notebook so let's look at that model building script uh let's run a couple of cells here we're going to bring in the data i just want to be able to show this to you live and then we're going to print out the data let's take a look at it ahead and we'll transpose it this is your first time getting a look at the data that i'm working with so as i talked about for each row, this is transposed, so a row is actually a column here. Uh, for, for this first row, we're looking at the San Antonio Spurs in 1980. We have the season there. Whether or not they won the championship, no, they did not in 1980. We have the games played in that season. You might think, why would you have games played? So this is actually a feature that I wanted to bring in and I make use of later because because of lockout seasons, uh, there are times when a season is not a full 82 games. Uh, you know, it might be 50 games or 60 games or something like that. And I actually wanted to scale my data to be raw stats per game to be able to account for that so that I could still use the data from those seasons and not have it be, have it be dramatically different. It keeps everything on that same scale. Um, there's this rank value. What rank is from this best basketball records API is actually the team that scored the most points that year, just a, a cumulative point scored for that team. So you can look at it at, it's not an offensive efficiency. It's just like, Raw offense, you scored a lot of points. Nothing to do with if you also played any defense. It's just, you know, you scored a lot. Uh, and then a bunch of stats that you would expect to have. We have a bunch of field goal percentages. We have assists, blocks, defensive rebounds, field goals attempts, field goals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can actually see I did the scaling, I think, already in this. Um, no, maybe I do that later. So we go down here uh, into the data exploration. Uh, I want to understand what does that data look like? This is the first step anyone does. And actually, interestingly, I am reusing the data exploration that was used in the original scikit-learn, term modeling for scikit-learn. I use the exact same um, data exploration steps and code that was used in there. So it made it really easy for me to do some quick data visualization. Data visualization isn't hard in Pandas, as you know, but to be totally honest, 
I always get really frustrated with matplotlib. Every time I use matplotlib, I have to re-Google like the syntax and how to work with it. So it was kind of nice just to be able to copy and paste um, a working example. I, I, you know, I'd probably, I didn't even have to copy and paste it. It was already in here. I could probably go out and, and find it as well, but just something that was handy to have. So if we look at um, a setup, so we can look at the feature opponent field goal percentage, and let's take a look at the distribution of that. Nothing very interesting there. Pretty standard, normal distribution of opponent field goal percentage. So um, then another visualization that they had is looking at it in a box plot and comparing the uh, two distributions of the champions, yes, and the non-champions, no. Um, so, you know, what you generally expect to see, the opponent field goal percentage is lower if you're winning a championship and higher if you're not winning a championship. There's even some pretty crazy outliers. It'd be fun to dig into that and see what seasons that come from. You know, our team's playing less defense now than they were playing, playing before, but I didn't do that. So this is just a general idea. We can go through and we can look at, you know, any, any of these different ones. So let's look at example opponent personal fouls. Why not? And drop that in here and take a look at the distribution of that fairly normal again uh, and actually opponent personal fouls kind of like a little bit more narrow not as many outliers in it but kind of the same distribution um, another thing that was built into the original churn modeling with scikit learn is you can see that we have this grid that was set up to look at possible um, <clears throat> relationships between different values different features so something that is actually kind of fun to see in here is that we start to see this notion of, hey, some of these features are uh, have some relationships between them. So we look at opponent personal fouls and free throw attempts. There's a very strong linear relationship between these two values. So not really surprising in the least bit because generally if you foul someone, they get free throws. Not always true. Like if it was exactly always true, this the bubble, the dots wouldn't be so wide, they'd be almost on a perfect line, but because sometimes there's personal files that result in no free throws, but a lot of times personal files result in free throws. So you can see more personal files, more free throws attempted per game. Okay, so what have we learned so far? Um, I can see right here, I have some, some collinearity within my data. I wanna explore that a little bit further. I wanna see how much collinearity do I have in, in my data? So if we take and look at, uh, this is something that was not in the original. I put together a bit of a heat map um, and I did a heat map. I dropped the top right because that's just re repeat data. And then as well, so I have a strong uh, correlation in the positive and in the negative. I colored green for positive and the darker pink it goes is the more negative it is. So you can see, if I look at this just real quick, uh, I can see, I see a lot of dark green. I see a lot of dark pink. That screams to me I am dealing with tons of collinearity within this. And also I have a lot of features and I only have a thousand rows worth of data because I'm only going from 1980. So these are, this is information that is educating me on the steps that I need to take within my data science process to be able to make a model that doesn't just train and perform well on my training data, but it's also going to extend well to data that it hasn't seen. So I have to take into account the multicollinearity that is strongly prevalent through this. And I also have to take into account, I have a lot of features I need to break down and probably not use all these features that I have available within my model. The last thing that um, screams to me in this problem is that I have imbalanced data. What do you mean by imbalanced data, you'd say, is that if we go up here to one of my past visualizations, you can see we colored champion is no within, these, uh, within the correlation between two and champion is yes. We have very few orange dots for every season, right? If there's 30 teams in a season, you have one champion, you have 29 non-champions. That means a model could very easily say, like we don't even need a model to create a very accurate prediction of if a team is gonna win a championship, just say, no, it's not gonna win a championship. Your model is gonna be right 29 out of 30 times. Um, sell that to whoever. If you could just pr place a bet on who will not win a championship and make a lot of money, a lot of people would make a lot of money, but that's not what we're trying to do to here today we want to be able to predict the champion and so what we want to do we can take that account in our model but there's also ways that we can take that to account ahead of time within our data so i played around with one way you can do it is under sampling so you look at the majority class in this case all the blue dots in here and i would say i'm going to drop some of those teams that didn't win a championship in a season i'm just going to drop that row from my data and you could drop you know 25 50 percent the downside of doing that is technically you're losing signal i'm losing 
actual data and having less data to work with. I only have a thousand rows to start with. If I drop 250 rows, I'm down to even less and I'm fighting even harder against the fact that there are so many features available within this. Thus, I opted to instead use uh, a process called Smoked, uh, which, ex which um, what it allows you to do is create synthetic examples of the minority class. So it takes a look at that minority class and it tries to create a more balanced representation of it. And it does it by not just like you could just resample the minority class and create duplicates, but it actually creates um, duplicates in between the minority class. So it creates uh, additional, actually additional rows that are not exactly the same to the original majority class, but are just slightly different. And it fills in all those different spaces between there. Uh, there are there are many different libraries available, many different methodologies to do this. I chose to use Smote. There are some downsides to it that I'll actually talk about later in this that create some blind sides within my predictions and my ability to be able to explain my predictions. But it actually improved my ability to create strong predictions dramatically. Uh, so if we look now, if you remember that that plot that we had before. Oh. I have to run that, we can see, okay, originally, if I print out the original shape of the data I was working with, I had a 1,164 rows. I now have 1,402 rows. And if I do that exact same grid, you can see now I have a lot more of these orange dots. I have a lot more data of champions to work with. They're not exactly um, real champions, right? Um, I'm, sure the, I'm sure the Lakers or I'm sure teams that don't have championships would love to create a synthetic championship but they don't get to do that. So last thing I'm gonna do before uh, I dive into the rest of, of what gets done is I'm gonna split up my data between my training data and my test data. Uh, I'm gonna hold out my test data and uh, use that to validate the kind of overall process that I'm gonna go through. So um, what I opted to do is actually, I wish I had pulled up um, a good example. If, if you're a beginning data scientist, if you go into scikit-learn as this, uh, you know, we talk about scikit-learn, they have a great, visualization of um, the different models to choose from. So it kind of walks through like a flow chart of, do you have, what kind of data do you have? How much of the data do you have? And it kind of walks you through and it points you to, in that instance, you should go with this model. And then if that model doesn't work, it asks another question and you can use this model. So I followed that steps just, just to be able to say like, hey, did, you know, does this work pretty well? And it helped me arrive at a pretty solid prediction. So we start out with, um, I did a random forest classifier. I wanted to explore all the different parameters that I could possibly work with. So I decided to use grid search CV. This goes through the process of cross validating my training data. So over and over again, it takes my training data. So I already have my training test data. It takes that training data and it splits up the training data between train and test. I train on that little bit of training data and then I test against the test data. And then I resample to a different training data within that and a different test data. And it keeps on doing that and it takes the average against all of those. And so uh, those are called your folds. So you can have like five fold, four fold, 10 fold, just depends on how long you're willing to sit in your seat or maybe how much compute power you can assign to what's being word and what's being worked and assign some greater parallelism. So what I did here, for example, for the random forest classifier, I went through, um, I talked about, I knew that I had a lot of features and I didn't want to have probably a lot of features to, to extend well to new data. So I use PCA to get the principal components out of my data. Um, I explored using 5, 20, 30, or the full 39 uh, features that were available as part of my PCA. Also for the model, we go through here, um, I looked at using different estimators, criterion, max features. These are different parameters that are assigned to the random force classifier. Uh, and it was super value to, to go through and look at that. Also, um, if you remember, SMOTE is a sampling strategy here. So I didn't just say, I'm going to do... Um, my my smoke one specific way i'm going to do it with 0.25 or 0.5 or 0.75 that means i take my under my uh, minority class and i upsample it to be 25 percent of the majority class or 50 percent of the majority class or 75 percent of the majority class also i assign a specific random state so that i can uh, do this kind of the same across multiple different models to compare them and know that it's doing it the same similar way and so that i'm not getting different results just because i took different samples um, and then lastly, in my going through my validation process, uh, I'm going to tune to different scoring methods. And so uh, within classification, you can tune to precision, recall, or F1. F1 is kind of a combination of precision and recall. We'll look at the results here, and I'll explain what those actually mean. 
And then lastly, I use another score that's available in, S in Scikit-Learn that's called Balanced Accuracy. So what that's do doing is taking into account that um, I do have an imbalanced data set. And so it's going to heavily weight and reward more for predictions of the underserved class or the minority class over the majority class. So if you look here, it goes through and it in the cross validation step, I'm gonna go for each score. So for precision, I'm gonna run my cross validation search and I'm gonna pass in, I'm gonna use these tune parameters. It's gonna go through all of it. N jobs equal negative one. If I use a very large instance, so a very large runtime and assign a lot of CPU and, GP and uh, memory to it, it'll go faster. And also for scoring, right, this is the score. So I'm gonna use precision for that. And then I'm gonna print, up, print, up, print out the results and do that for each of the different scoring. So the results are tuning hyper, hyper parameters for precision uh, you can see this was the best parameter set for tuning for precision uh, with this class weight, this criterion, et cetera, et cetera. Interesting, if you look in here, it used for PCA, uh, principal component analysis, it opted for five features, which speaks uh, very, very strongly to what I was saying is that there are a lot of values in there and likely it would be better if there were not so many, like up to 30 of them. Um, and then also the sampling strategy, the smote, it's selected to be 25% of the majority class. We look at the results. Um, we can look at the precision recall and F1 score of predicting yes. So to interpret this, 0.4, that means that um, for yeses, it was right 40% of the time when it predicted that it was a champion. So 60% of the time, it was wrong. Um, not amazing, but actually the recall in this was not horrible. What recall is of all the champions that are available for this, if you look at support, it's nine. So in this test data set, we have nine champions, 224 non-champions. It means it, uh, those nine, it got 67% of them. Uh, so that was probably missing just like two, two or three, I like, guess correctly. And then the ones that didn't get right, um, I can kind of look at it as I'm probably likely guessing like the top four or five teams or, or this one is probably the top two or three teams, um, right? And then I'm capturing the actual one that really won 67% of the time. So not horrible. And the last thing that I point out is this balance test score, which is I'm using the balance accuracy score. This is available scoring metric in scikit-learn. You pass in your true, your true values and, and what's actual. And again, it's taking into account um, the imbalanced data and it's assigning greater, uh, greater penalty if I predict uh, no when it's actually yes. And so when I take that into account, I get 81% as my balanced test score. Not that bad really when you, when you look at it. It goes through and I did it again for recall and I did it again for F1. And you can see the results as I tune to different ones are slightly different. So for recall, slightly different parameters were selected. The precision and the, and the recalls are different. The precision is higher and the recall is higher. That's really interesting. And my balance test score is up to 86%. Um, and then I also did it for F1, a kind of a combination of the two. So precision 0.43, um, I went through and I did this for a bunch of different models. I did it for a K&N classifier. I assigned a bunch of different values to that. Um, this was another one that was recommended by the scikit-learn flowchart and you can see I had really good results with this. So precision was actually lower, 0.36 than what I was getting, but look at this recall, 0.89. That means it got eight of the nine champions correct against data that it had never seen. And then, uh, so I think that's actually pretty cool with precision that's not horrible. And when you go through, I'll show you in uh, like in the 2022 data, the other teams that it's predicting when it does this are very highly ranked teams, teams that, uh, people would probably place a lot of money on to win the championship. And the balance test score here was 91. So our highest yet. If you go through, we had another 91, and another 91. Kanan, the Kanan classifier did great. When I tuned it for balance accuracy, actually a little bit worse, but the recall for that one was perfect. It did really bad at the gradient boosting classifier. So we're gonna skip over that. Um, and then the last two that we're gonna talk about is a linear SVM classifier and a non-linear SVM classifier. This was what I was guessing to be probably the best. Um, one of the ways that, that SVN, uh, one of the, no, not one of the ways, one of the instances in where SVNs perform really well is when your data does actually have a lot of collinearity because it's trying to find that feature space in the, 
kind of in the gaps and it is able to handle that multicollinearity super well. Uh, also has that regularization built into the model. So it kind of kind of helps you narrow it, uh, navigate through that. So if we look at how this one did, we can see, all right, 0 0.23, 0 0.89, um, balance test score of 0.88. That's not really our best one, a 0 0.88, 0 0.88, and a 0.88. All of them are about the same 0 0.24, 0 0.89 in my precision recall F1.36. I went then to a nonlinear, and this was the one when I said I, I like tapped out of a large session that was running. Uh, this was the one that was still running. You can see the parameter space that I'm working in for the grid search, super large. So it was taking a long time to run. I tried to create uh, just kind of last minute before this, I tried to create a very large session and be able to have it run and finish, but I, I was able to get the one to run that I really wanted to run. And it's it's this example here. So balance test score, 0.93, our best yet. You can see precision, 0.23, not great. Kind of like one, uh, it, it's gonna get one out of four correct, but recall a perfect one. That means it guessed every single of my champions that I have in my test data set, it got them right. This was really intriguing to me. And so I actually ended up choosing this one in the end as my model to put in production. Um, I could have very easily chosen the, go back up here, the k classifier. The one downside of the k classifier is that if you go back and look at the original churn modeling with scikit-learn application that was built, it was built around looking at the probabilities and probabilities is what I was really interested in. I, I didn't want to just see a single prediction for a season. This team will win, no one else will win. I wanted to break it down and be able to see like, are there teams because it's guessing kind of like it, it's guessing one in four correct. Are there teams that are clumped together to have like a higher probability? So all of them are like above 0.5 or something like that. And then does it drop drastically after that? With KNN classifier, because the best one was using end neighbors of one, um, and the way that KNN classifier is built, when you use the probability prediction out of um, out of the train model, it it really doesn't work. You kind of just get one and a bunch of zeros. So I'm not getting that probability value that I want, that I get when I use the SVM, the nonlinear SVM. So I opted to use a nonlinear SVM and to go forward with that. Now that I have that nonlinear SVM, I went ahead and I used almost a pretty similar train model. This is, is a little different than the one that was available in scikit-learn um, because my data science was very different, right? So I go through, this is just implementing kind of the steps that we went through, um, the same data preparation steps, the same selecting the specific columns that I want to work with. Um, one interesting thing is that I'm, I'm splitting out the 2022 data because that is what essentially is my holdout data. That's what we're going to be predicting and looking at. Also, there's no champion yet for 2022. I don't know who won, so that's really data that isn't of much use because it's actually not applicable for champion for this year. So I held that data out. I trained on the rest of the data that I have, have available rather than training on the training set like I was doing before with the cross-validation. And then I go through and I implement what were the parameters for the best model. So if you remember, right, it was SVC. It was the RBF kernel. So we're not working with linear uh, class weight balanced. Uh, this is not surprising because balance means this thing to account the imbalanced data gamma of 0 0.001, and I'm using probabilities so that I can predict probabilities out of it. I'm using SMOTE in there with the sampling strategy of 25%. So I'm taking my minority class and upsampling it to be 25% of the, of, the, of the count of the majority class. I'm using a standard scalar because I have mixed in percentages and, um, uh, and raw values per game. Those are two very, like 0.8 is very different than uh, 20 and from 20 to 21 is a full value, but 0.8 to 0.9, even though that's only 0.1, that's a larger difference. So we need to be able to scale the differences between those so that both of those features have the same amount of importance within the model and have the opportunity to affect it. And then lastly, the PCA that it came out with, uh, I'm actually just using five uh, components out of there. It was able to get the signal that it needed from just five features. Well, not five features, but a representation of five. And then I go through and I fit that model. So this is where um, I go back and actually am pretty close to what the original scikit learn is. I create a Lime explainer. I was able to use this exactly from, almost exactly what was available in the term modeling of scikit learn AMP. Um, what, it, what this is doing is Lime is a library that's available. I kind of mentioned it at the beginning, but it allows you to, even for nonlinear models, 
it actually goes through and it's like it trains a brand new model off of one one specific sample and uh, don't pay attention to the people moving behind me that that's going to happen possibly throughout but um j just have fun with it let's just say that it's a gif recording and, and that's not a thing um anyway so with with the lime explainer what it's doing it allows me to to take a trained uh, a prediction and it looks at that prediction and it moves actually that prediction a little bit um, of all the different features that go into it. And then it gets the prediction from the trained model. And then what it does is assigns basically like linear coefficients to each one of those so that you can actually look at um, the how changing one of those values is going to affect that single prediction. So it's really cool because even if I have a model that is highly complex and usually these highly complex nonlinear models um, is... Uh, Usually those are issues because you don't, it's not very interpretable, right? I don't have nice linear coefficients out of it. It's not linear regression. It's not a single uh, decision tree, but this allows you to be able to explain to your business users actually what's going on within it and allows you to understand it. We'll be able to look at that within the application. And then I use this, if you remember this explained model. So this is a class that was provided in scikit-learn or not in scikit-learn, within the churn modeling for scikit-learn AMP. If we open that up, uh, this is the class. It has a bunch of these functions and methods within it that allow you to uh, like store kind of everything together. It allows you to create predictions and predictions that also pass out um, the probability and the feature importances that are part of that, et cetera, et cetera. I made some changes to us, but I'd say like roughly 80 to 90% of this I left alone, just had to figure out, you know, what was different and apply that kind of throughout. Um, so when you run that, we get an explain model and I'm going to save it. I'm going to save the name. You, you can see I left this exactly the same. Telco linear uh, is the model name of the original scikit-learn. So if we go uh, and hop out here, let's go out. Let's look at um, in the files, models, telco linear. This is their model that's been pickled. It's ready to go. It's ready to provide predictions. Um, let's hop back into our session. You can see then to be, able, to be able to serve that up, I have this same script that was available within the original AMP. And it shows me how to take that, how to call out that explain model class, how to pull the model out of it, uh, unpickle it, and to be able to create predictions out of it with this function. And then the last script, just to point out, is the actual application. Again, reuse this, um, like 90% of this was reused from the original. I just had to change a little bit of the, to be the specifics of my model. And I added in a little bit of, uh, because I took out some of the um, work that was going on to include categorical features. My data had zero categorical features. The technical linear one, if you remember, there was like whether someone was signed up for a year or a month or a day, um, they had to take that into account. I didn't have to take that account. So I just blasted it and didn't use it. So let's go ahead and take a look at my model. I have it served up here. It is deployed. You can see, you can pass in this data we can test it, and with any luck during a live demo, success. I pass in these features, Twenty a team that had four a season, 28 assists, four blocks, 30 defensive rebounds per game, 94 field goal attempts per game, et cetera, et cetera. The probability of them winning the NBA championship is 0 .004, not doing well, probably not going to win. And we also have this explanation. So this is a result of line, right? It went through, it took this individual row, and it and it moved all the features, all the input features a little bit up and down. And then it found by doing that, which one of the, uh, which movement created the most difference to the actual predicted value, this probability. Let's hop over now. Fun way to explore it is in the actual application. So we'll open up here, the NB. Oh, actually, I'm not going to do that. I actually already have this opened up, so we don't have to wait for it to go through and predict each one of those. So. After talking through everything, here is the result of my work. I predict that the Utah Jazz will win the 2022 NBA championship. No, like I said, this isn't perfect. This is data science. Utah Jazz already eliminated, kind of imploded very epically. But my second team, Boston Celtics, totally still in it, doing great, tied series. I think that they have a great chance to win it all. Third place, 
the statistical darling of the year, the Phoenix Suns. Everyone thought they were a juggernaut. A juggernaut. Of course, my model thinks that they have a really good chance of winning at 55%. It would predict, yeah, go for it. So, and then rounding up my top four, the Golden State Warriors, uh, that championship pedigree just shining through, really. And then after that, huge drop off in the probability of champions, right? So we went like 0.65 to 0.45 is that probability space. And then it drops down to 0.16. So uh, sorry, Milwaukee's right there. But my model totally knew Milwaukee was going to was gonna blow it during Boston in game seven. Not true. But uh, Memphis, Denver, Brooklyn, Cleveland, a lot of these are championship teams. I'm a huge Chicago Bulls fan way down here. I knew they weren't winning the championship when they won the second game against the, against the Milwaukee Bucks. But at least they weren't like the worst team. At least they weren't Portland down here. Uh, shout out to Emma, who who is helping run this. They they were not looking good in my model. So let's take a step back. If you remember, I said Lime has some downsides. Um, one of the re- ways it has the downsides is because of the way it does and finds that feature space to create the linear... Uh, create the linear model, if your training data and your test data are actually very different in their distributions and like the aspects of their data, it doesn't perform as well as it could. And if you remember, I'm using Smote. I'm explicitly taking my training data and I'm upsampling the um, the minority data to create new synthetic data that doesn't actually exist. And that doesn't exist in my test data. So I knew Lion probably wasn't going to work amazing for individual each individual row. However, if you look at it as a whole, actually some really interesting things. So let's take a look at, for example, rank. Rank is a value that is the total like points scored for a team for the season, right? This is actually saying, so red, the more red it is, the more positive the the coefficient is out of it. And so it's saying that like a team like Milwaukee, even though like for their total points scored was three, it's actually saying if if they went up in this value, They would have a better chance of winning the NBA championship. You would say, Jake, that makes no sense. The goal of NBA of a basketball game is to score more points. But because of all the culinary that's that exists within my data set, something that line doesn't, it's it's just doing straight linear um, model, right? It's not taking any of those culinary values into effect. This is probably also saying that like it would probably better if them for them to play a little more defense. So not score so many points, focus a little bit more on the defensive end. And you can see that throughout. So two, three, five, seven for each one of these rows, it said like maybe you should be a little higher in your point scored and slow down the pace a little bit. So there's this idea of pace that could be involved in here. But for the really low teams, the 23, 26, 18, 22, it's saying, yeah, okay, um, New York Knicks, you guys need to score more points if you're going to win a basketball game. I don't think anyone would, would disagree with that. If we go through and look at some of the other features that had a lot for each individual row, right? This is calculating the line. Um, interpretability, like defensive rebounds, you're always going to want more defensive rebounds. You're never going to want less defensive rebounds. For the most part, you're always going to what want more opponent blocks. So this is another weird one. The way I would interpret this actually is that it, it might not might not be accurate, but for opponent blocks, it probably denotes the amount of time the team is driving to the hoop and having the opportunity to be blocked. I would like to also bring in a feature that said like driving attempts. There's so many like raw more like camera data video data that we have from different data sources that we incorporate in this to see what is the correlation between those two components but what the way i would interpret this is that like you should drive more to the hoop because even if you get blocked more the the dunk is the highest percentage most efficient shot even daryl Morey will agree with that then for opponent but then there are some teams that's like hey stop getting blocked so much looking at you memphis um, and then, so we go through any of the other features that really jump out to me, opponent two point field goal percentage, you don't want them to get easy buckets. So always for the most part, you know, make them shoot a lower two point field goal percentage. And the last one way over here, your own two point field goal percentage, really maximize that. It's really strong, um, for each row we can, because I rebuilt this from the original term modeling with scikit learn. I can look at this individual prediction for the Utah Jazz, uh, their champion probably at 0.652. Uh, this is the defensive rebounds right now, 35.561. Uh, you can see it has Lime had this um, this value point out 0.05, and I can actually submit a new value for it here. So instead of getting 35 rebounds, what if the Jazz, what if Rudy Gobert went up there and got just one more rebound a game on average? 
you know, he really exerted some effort. Their championship probability would have gone up a little bit. It's all Rudy Gobert's fault. That's what my model is pointing out. Just joking to any of Utah Jazz fans out there. Um, that's it. That's what I have to sh share today. Remember, I started from predicting. Uh, I had a, a demonstration of how to predict uh, churn for a telecommunications company. I scrapped that. I built something completely new, predicting NBA, something that's really interesting. I can't believe I get paid to do this. It's a lot of fun. Um, but then as well, I was able to reuse a lot of that original one to build a web application. This is something I could share this link. I could send it to Santiago. Santiago could look at it. He could say, like, I have no idea of an NBA, but I'm going to put a lot of money on this Utah Jazz. And then he could call me later and he could say, Jake, I lost some money because of your model. And we can have great dialogue from it. Um, and that's what I have to share today. Let's go ahead and, and hop over to questions. Awesome. Thank you, Jake. That was uh, very enlightening and um, and very thorough. I think um, I, I definitely learned a lot from from watching you and uh, and and I'm sure that the rest of the uh, the crew watching all over YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter did as well. Um, we do have some really great questions, um, and and I think we might as well just kick it right off. Um, so the first one we have here is uh, kind of a kind of a softball. Uh, how do we access this platform? Um, so I guess I, I can take that one, uh, Jake, just since it's a little bit more kind of generic. Um, so there's a couple different moving pieces here, right? The um, the applied machine learning prototype that Jake used is open source, so you can access that on GitHub, um, as well as the code for the completed project that Jake has. Uh, that one is will also be shared in the resources section um, when we move there here in just a moment. Um, the Cloudera machine learning platform itself um, is accessed by being a Cloudera customer. So if you'd like to have a conversation around that, definitely reach out uh, uh, reach out to us and we can talk about how Cloudera Machine Learning can, can serve you. Um, okay, the next one here is, what is the size of the MBA data used here? And I think you did cover that, Jake, but maybe you wanna reinforce yeah, it. Yeah, it was about 1,000 rows, right? So for each season, I'm getting every every team for that season the stats for that season. So from 1980 to 20 through the 2020 21 22 or 2021 season for my training data, which resulted in about a thousand rows and like 39 features roughly. Awesome. Um, and that question was uh, was from Kumar on YouTube, by the way. Um, the next one, uh, did I hear you say Sportsify? And that's from Toby B on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah, uh, not, not Sportsify, Sportsy Pie. Um, so if you, if you go look in um, the code, my code, you can see the actual library in there. Um, I'm gonna be, I'm adding a little bit of uh, extra flavor to it. So that's it. It's like not a super well supported open source library. I made it work. There's a few little tricks. Um, you need to use Python 3.7 for it to work really well. Even though the rest of my work I did in Python 3.6. Nice thing about Clutter Machine Learning, I can switch between kernels for different library versions that I want to work with to make it easy for me. Um, and then as well, I actually ended up making a bit of a change to the source code. It's one of the, you know, one of the, the great things about working in the open source community with libraries that aren't like super well supported. Um, you might find a bit of an error, but with a little bit of searching, I was able to figure it out. So yeah, awesome. sportsy pie. And, it, and you can actually, so I use it for NBA, but they also, like, you can use it for MLB, hockey, um, even, they, I hear some people like stats out of baseball, too. There might be a market for that. <laughs> Doubtful. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, any baseball fans out there? Um, okay. <laughs> so the next question here, um, and actually, we can make this a two-parter. It's from Jorge on YouTube. Uh, he asks if you created any features and if there is any indicator for full season versus locked season. What was, the, what was the second part of that, Santi? Any indicator for a full season versus a locked season? Um, so I did do that. If you, if I talked about it briefly. I took into account the, I have in, as one of my columns is games played in that season. And so the actual col original columns for each one of them just had like the total amount for that season. So for, it had defensive rebounds total for the season. I took that value for every one of them that I could. So not percentage, but any of the raw counting stats. And I actually divided it by the games played that season to be able to take into account those locked out seasons. Then I dropped the games played in the season uh, as one of the columns. I didn't for this one create any new features. That is, you know, I kind of talked about it when doing a data science project. There's like 
iterations upon iterations upon iterations that you can do. I plan on in further iterations, one, creating my own new features of kind of combining it. Uh, but then as well, there are a lot of really interesting, like I love 538 blog. They create a lot of really neat advanced stats. I would love to incorporate that into this model and see how they affect it. Maybe if I just use a few of those advanced stats um, instead of all of these raw accounting stats, because those advanced stats generally take into multiple one of those, something like a you know, effective field goal percentage and things like that. Uh, maybe I could get by with just that and it's capturing all of the all of the signal that I need in order to give an accurate prediction. So those are like further things that I could do that I would love to do. It's all about just if you have time. Santiago just let me do do more of this, you know. <laughs> awesome, Jake. Um, okay, so the next question we have here is uh, from Jeff, who's watching on YouTube. Um, and he asks, did I hear you say there was some kind of model selection walkthrough or wizard? Uh, was that a Cloudera feature or open source? And I think he's referring uh, to the AMPs overall, but if you want to talk about it, Jake. Yeah, so the, the AMPs overall, that that's a Cloudera thing. I don't know if he, maybe he's talking about grid search for my parameter searching or... Mm -hmm. The one thing I did make mention of, and I can I can add it to um, I don't know somehow Bill if we, that's listening on this and help set this up. Um, I was making I referenced the Scikit-Learn flowchart of how to select one of the Scikit-Learn models. Maybe that's what he was talking about. Um, and it's something that's very handy if you're if you're new to data science and and you don't have any a lot of background for like which model is going to work great instead of just like throwing something against the wall, which you can totally do, right? If you have the time, but you can go through that chart and it'll be like, do you have more or less than a hundred rows? Do you have, is your data structured or unstructured? Um, do you, is this a classification or a regression problem? And then it'll point you to the models to use. And if the model doesn't work well, it'll then ask you another question and say like, um, is your data look like this? And then it'll suggest another model and it kind of walks you through the path of the different things to try out. Basically saying like, instead of trying 20 different things, these are the three that we would recommend that are likely to work well. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so Jeff also asks, uh, how is how did you split your training and test data? Um, he points out the nine champions from what you were showing seems uh, low. Yeah, so I, it was just a random train test split um, because it, it's going to be low, right? If we look at um, if, if I'm, I'm splitting, I think I split out like 30 percent of the data. For each season, there's only one champion. So when I split out 30% of the data, that's not it ended up being about nine seasons worth of data. So I have nine champions to have in my test data. In my train data is when I use Smote to be able to create synthetic values of champions to be able to basically upsample that so that my training data had more of an even distribution, which bottles tend to do a little better with. What I'm really doing is like I'm I'm creating a louder signal for those champions within my training data. And then my test data. I want that to be the actual same distribution as what I have. I want, I want the same um, imbalanced data set so I can see how does my model work in the real world. In the real world, there isn't synthetic data. As I said, like the Portland Trailblazers Blazers can't create a championship this year. It's just not possible. Got it. Um, and then Ryan from YouTube is asking, and this is a conversation Jake, you and I had earlier today, is how did you ensure that your model isn't overfitted? And how do you know that it's not? Yeah, so one of the fun, one of my favorite like aspects of, of of data science is when you start to like play around the edges of acceptable, not acceptable data science, but things that you know like I probably shouldn't be doing this, but I'm going to try doing this, and in this instance, it works very well. So I knew I was I was I was overfitting in my training data, right? I create a bunch of these synthetic examples. I have all these feature spaces. The biggest thing that you want to do is that your methodology is still sound. So even though I'm doing maybe weird things that are overfitting within my training data that <laughs> might look like over like overfitting, like if you go and look at the results and my cross validation of the training data, it looks like it's fit very well to that data, which is can be a, a red flag. But it still performs really well in this test data that I held up that it's never seen before. Um, so as long as I keep that consistent, that same test set held out for all the different models, and I can compare how all of them uh, perform against that test set. I can safely feel like even I'm overfitting to this training data, but the training data is an appropriate representation. It, the test data, they're the, you know, they're similar enough to where I'm still getting good model performance. And so you're always fighting a little bit that that relationship between overfitting and over and underfitting. And it's just a matter of being able to understand the process that goes into it and making sure you're keeping yourself in check. Um, I definitely had times where I went in and I, I like I 
in a past company, we literally had an imbalance data problem and we accidentally let the, the um, undersampling, we did undersampling for that. We let that bleed into our test data and we we're like, our model's killing it. Look how great it's doing in the test data until uh, I finally caught like, hold up, we augmented the test data so that it's not an actual representation of what we're going to see in the real world. So our model is over overperforming. We figured this out like the night before. I just remembered this vividly and had to like push back the report out meeting to a bunch of these higher ups to be like, our model that we said was great actually sucks. Nice, nice. Um, okay, so let's see, moving on here. Jorge on YouTube asks, how can we re replicate this? And I think we covered some of that, but Jake, maybe reiterate on the the open source nature of the GitHub repositories and what it looks like in Cloud Era and elsewhere. Yeah, for sure. So sure modeling with scikit-learn is open source. That link will be provided in the resources for, from this meetup. Also, I provided all the code that I showed you today from my from the own work that I did. That exact same code that I walked you through is available on there. So the scripts to download the MBA data, create that CSV, the feature engineering exploration that I did, and the model training with the grid search, all that is, is available for you to use as well. There's even like the Flask application is is in there um and uh, the the function to serve up the model that stuff is a little bit more relevant if you're a cloud era customer but going through and training the model and creating your own nba model uh that is something that anyone could do in just any like jupiter environment awesome um we have a question here that i think is a good one uh just reflecting the amps work uh is why is the winning probability in red and i guess the, the short answer to that is that we started with a churn modeler. Um, so higher probability of churn is typically bad for a business. So it was in red. And then Jake didn't do any additional work to change the uh, change the visualization color structures. Jake ran out of time and was lazy. No, <laughs> I'm a Bulls fan, so red to me is good. And I was like, see red, see more red, more championships. Six-time NBA champion, Chicago Bulls. So that's why. I was going to say because because it's red hot, right, those teams? Red hot. Oh, yeah. I like that. For sure. Look at you. You're NBA fan, Santi. <laughs> um, okay, let's see here. Moving on. Um, so Kumar brought up this interesting question um, that I think would have complicated your model quite a bit. It's, uh, what's your opinion on using, using individual player data instead of using team data to make these same predictions? Yeah, so something that I really want to do, uh, if you listen to the big, I'm like an NBA junkie. So Ryan Rossillo, uh, in the BS podcast with Bill Simmons. He's been talking a lot about lately. Like he's went and looked through how teams that rely heavily on individual players. Uh, so you look at like the usage stats, teams that have a single player with really high usage stats tend to perform really badly in the playoffs. So they might kill it during the regular season. Uh, traditionally think of someone like, I don't know, like Trey Young or even like Luka Doncic this year. He's been a bit abnormal up to this point. He's done really well, right? His team's been shooting well around him. But usually those teams that have the high single high usage player tend to break down as the playoffs go on just because so much has been going through them. Their team isn't used to like, how do I actually do things when I get the ball? Because in the playoffs, you can game plan for a specific person in their style. So they can send double teams at them. That high usage player now has to pass the ball. They're not able to be as effective. Um, and the team suffers as a whole. So some things that I would love to incorporate is like the uh, feature I'd love to have is the individual for each team, the in, uh, the highest usage rating for an individual on that team. So that would be like, I could add that into a single world. That would be really interesting. You could add like the highest scoring player on the team. Do teams that have like a really high score, they're probably also the team that has a really high usage player, but how does that affect the thing? Can you look at like the standard deviation of scoring amongst the team, amongst the five starters? There's lots of different things. Like it's endless what you could do to create, to add additional features and see how they perform, what the relationship is between um, championship and non-championship. Totally thought about doing that. Totally ran out of time. <laughs> um, so th there's two questions related to this. Um, I guess the first one here from Ramesh on YouTube is, uh, is there even individual player data available uh, in the open that, that you could have used for that? Yeah, in basketballreference.com, like that's my favorite place to go for NBA data. It's like open source, you don't got to pay for it. They have really awesome breakdowns of individual player data. Your data is going to get, it's like a lot messier to kind of, well, not messier, but it's a lot more data when you start wading through that for sure. But it, it's available. It's available from other places too. I just tend to use basketball reference because it's a little bit um, more open in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Nice. And then I guess the, the follow-up to that one is, and I think you talked about this, if you could add more extensions to, uh, to the model or to your data or to features, 
what would you have done? Yeah, I think like I really like the idea of using that usage per player. I really like the idea of incorporating some individual players. If I wanted to get really, if I wanted to do a lot of work, I could also um, put in some like playoff, past playoff performance. And as the playoffs go on, I could update those features within the 2022 data for prediction to see like how a team performs as they get closer to the finals. Like that'd be a pretty interesting thing to have, but that's like changing your point in time and, and to, it gets a little bit messy doing that, but that's additional information that you could have. Um, I'd like to incorporate, like I was talking about some of the advanced stats. I'd like to incorporate some of the um, other, like they have data now that's based around like video imagery. So how far players are running. So I'd love to look at things like do teams that move the ball more, how much the ball actually moves. So they count like the number of dribbles the teams uses versus the number of passes they have. I'd like to incorporate that. So like the Warriors, they pass the ball a lot, a lot more than the Mavs. Is that beneficial to them? Is that been beneficial as time gone on or teams that dribble a little bit more and, and pass it less? Do they tend to win more championships? All that kind of stuff. I, I would love to explore and add into it. Yeah, awesome. I just need two of me to be able to do that. To be able to actually to do all that, all that work. Um, and this actually goes well. Uh, this isn't a question, but more of a comment from Ryan on YouTube, who said pass percentage would be a really helpful attribute to have in this too, um, which I think you did have, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So we're down to the last couple of questions here. Um, uh, one, th this is probably a good one, um, just generally. Uh, Jake, do you know of any other good places uh, to get open source data to practice machine learning? It doesn't doesn't need to be sports related, but do you have like a, a hit list of top three places where people should start? Yeah, I would like, if you're just going to start with this, I love pointing people to Kaggle. Kaggle has a lot of really um, like specific data sets, clean data sets, and they give you direction as far as like, hey, try to predict this using this data set. So it gives you exact things that you're trying to do and also gives you a lot of good like examples of past things that people have done. So they, they, they host competitions. They'll show you what the winner's work look like that you can model your work off of. And they also have like really good beginner type problems. That's where it's like the Titanic problem. So predicting whether or not someone will die that was on the Titanic, a little morbid, but kind of a cool data set and some really strong signals in there. Um, as far as like fun, more fun data, uh, 538, which I mentioned, they open source all of their data that they work with to do their analysis. So they have a lot of really interesting stuff. It's kind of fun just to go to data.gov for, for US data. There's like census data. There's all sorts of data in data.gov through thanks to the push for open sourcing a lot of our government data. Uh, and then lastly, like a classic one is just UC Irvine has a lot of open data sets um, from like research type data. That can be fun. But probably my favorite is 538. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so let's see here. Uh... So Alex uh, Dedrov on YouTube wants to know, um, how would you change your model to predict, let's say, a single match outcome? Or is that even possible with the data set that you used? Not, not possible. So I'd have to, what, what my data set would look like that for each row when it, in it would be an individual matchup. And then who won that matchup, essentially. Like, it's almost a completely different data set. And that is a ton more data, which could be advantageous, right? If you want to build a model that predicts who's going to win a match. Um, you're going to have, a, you're going to have for an 82 game season, you have, uh, every team played 82 games. So you have, uh, you know, depending on the season that you start excess of 30 teams, you have 82 games for each. There's a lot of data that you can train off of that. And then you can see who won in that matchup. And then you could, you could train a model off of that. So that's it. That's a way that you can model your data to set to do that. My model wouldn't do that. Um, just the way that the data has been set up. Got it. Um, awesome. And then we're down to the last question here, which I think is an important one. Um, why did you end up choosing the churn model, churn modeling AMP uh, for the NBA prediction instead of any other model or, or other approaches? Yeah. So um, looking at it, I knew like, from my own experience, I knew that scikit-learn had, had a lot of the libraries that, I, that I'd want to work with in order to do this. And so it was in the name of the title, churn modeling with scikit-learn. So that was that was rather handy. Um, and it also had the interpretability aspect of it and the visualization built in. And I wanted to do that. It was structured data, um, which I know I was going to be working with. And it was trying to do a classification problem, right? Churn modeling, yes or no. I had a two-class a two class classification problem. 
uh, that was the same as well. So there were like some things that were lining up that were similar. Uh, so I decided to give it a try. I could have used maybe some of the other ones, uh, but had a good time doing it this way. All right then. Well, Jake, that's all the questions we had. Thank you for uh, thank you for presenting. Um, and thank then you. let's uh, we'll move on. Uh, soon you should be seeing the resources where you'll have access to the original applied machine learning prototype, um, the GitHub repositories uh, that Jake uh, walked through today, um, as well as additional resources um, for you to continue to explore things around AMPs um, and our user resources at Cloudera overall. Um, uh, participants uh, should know that you may receive a survey. Uh, I highly encourage you all to, to participate. We want to continue to improve um, improve this meetup uh, to come up with very interesting topics for you all um, and to and to continue to, to be part of this community in, in a meaningful and significant way. And that only really works um, if, if we have everybody kind of uh, giving us feedback on, on how we can continue to improve um, what's working, what isn't, and how we continue to move forward. So without further ado, uh, we're going to go ahead and switch to the raffle. All right. So as I mentioned before, two winners. Uh, we're going to go ahead and click to spin. Everybody that commented um, and participated today uh, is in the running. All right, Chester King. And uh, we'll we'll have instructions on how to uh, how to send us your information so we can send you uh, your prize um, as we. Uh, as we wrap this up. And then for the second winner. All right, Toby B, awesome. Okay, well, excellent. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping here on, uh, on, on claiming your prize. Uh, for the two winners, please email socialmedia at cloudera.com. Uh, here you can send us your contact information and, uh, and we'll get your prizes out to you as soon as possible. So with that, uh, on behalf of the team, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out and helping make this such a great event. Um, we had some really awesome questions. I think engagement was really great. Um, and we look forward to doing a lot more of these, uh, specifically around AMPs and machine learning projects that Jake and the rest of the team is going to be working on. Um, we look forward to seeing you at the next Future of Data Meetup. And thank you for participating and, uh, and watching today. Thank you.